Welcome everyone to tonight's book launch hosted by the Academy of Ideas. My name is Ella Whelan, I work with the Academy of Ideas and tonight we are delighted to be hosting the official launch of uh, Professor Frank Faraday's new book, Democracy Under Siege, Don't Let Them Lock It Down. And today is the launch day of that book. Um, so make sure you get your orders in either through the publishers or through Amazon, it's available on all um, official places to get new releases. Uh, and it definitely is a must read. And then something which isn't a formality, but uh, is worth mentioning is that the Academy of Ideas hasn't furloughed anyone throughout this period. We've been working throughout the lockdown as you regular visitors to our events will have known by now. And that means we need your help. Uh, we're very aware that this is a difficult time for many people and uh, incomes aren't as easy to come by as they perhaps once were. But if you can uh, give anything, then any donation, small or large, is really appreciated by the team and helps us to continue putting on these kinds of events, especially with the news that things aren't going to change potentially anytime soon where we need your help more than ever. So thank you for your support, those of uh, you who have bought us already. And any uh, link, any donations can be sent to www.academyofideas.org.uk forward slash donate, which I will put in the chat now. Right, um, now I want to introduce Frank, uh, someone who doesn't need a, a great deal of introduction to many people because he's a regular speaker and something of our own philosopher at the Academy of Ideas has always been um, a keynote speaker at our Battle of Ideas Festival throughout the years. Uh, Frank himself is a sociologist and a commentator and author of a huge number of books, which I can't read all of them out right now, um, you know, Culture of Fear, On Tolerance, Authority, Paranoid Parenting, on Education, on Reading, um, he, he's even had, this is his second book out this year. Uh, he actually released Why Borders Matter earlier in the year, which we had a book launch for, which he was intending to be his singular book of, of 2020, but um, which was, is a fascinating book on the issue of borders, both physical and metaphorical and political. But uh, as he puts it in the beginning of Democracy Under Siege, things were happening in politics in relation to coronavirus, but also in relation to Brexit and other trends that meant that he felt that he just had to sit down and write this very short, sharp um, intervention into the discussion around democracy and, you know, publishers, which are usually slow to get off the ground, were quick this time around. And so Frank is celebrating his second book of the year. Democracy Under Siege, Don't Let Them Lock It Down is, is not primarily about coronavirus. In fact, uh, the, that really only gets a mention latterly in the book. In fact, what it is, it is a defense of democracy in, in and of itself as a value that societies should cohere around, something that needs a bit more of a political debate and political intrigue that he argues that democracy is something of a, a that people have lost faith in um, for various ways. And so it's a really a must read for anyone who wants to get to grips with what it is that's going on in uh, today's politics. So how this is gonna work is I'm going to ask Frank just a few questions, three or four to kick things off. Um, and then what I'll do is come out to the floor and we can have a true Academy of Ideas, Battle of Ideas Festival style discussion about the uh, questions that Frank raises. Of course, none of, very few of you anyway, unless you've been lucky enough to get a preview, will have read the book. Um, but I'm hoping that me and Frank will tease out some things that we have to kick out, uh, kick off a discussion tonight. So, Frank, welcome. Hi. And uh, the first question I want to put to you tonight really was why now? I mean, I mentioned coronavirus and Brexit, but there are other things that you mentioned that sparked your interest in writing a book like this. So why in 2020, when it actually feels very hard to think about democracy under our current conditions, have you written this book? I think the main reason is because uh, I noticed even before the pandemic that uh, there was a stream of uh, opinion being published where, which was very hostile to the capacity of people to determine their future, who were arguing that, you know, you really cannot rely upon the electorate to make uh, the right kind of decisions. Uh, you had people saying that democracy was overrated and okay, we can have democracy, but we don't want to have too much democracy. And I just thought the idea that, there, that you can have too much democracy or you can have too much freedom um, 
indicated uh, that there was uh, a real mean-spirited dislike of democracy and hatred of democracy. And you can see that today, for example, because these trends have become extremely uh, solidified since the pandemic. You can see it now that uh, every day, virtually every day, you'll find something being published. Today, for example, there's a common piece in the Times that essentially argues that because of COVID, uh, people have lost faith in democracy. And what they really mean by that, and this is a point that's been emphasized time and time again, is that uh, in China or in Asia, where you have authoritarian regimes, they are really good at sorting out the problems. You know, they don't need to consult the people. You have all these experts who are backed up by the state and they can get things done, you know, pretty efficiently. Whereas in a place like Britain and Italy, people are messing around. They sometimes riot. They don't follow the rules. Um, they really are, uh, are, are not particularly good at um, bringing the right kind of changes about. And governments who are in some shape or form accountable to a democratic electorate are not really that good at dealing with these kinds of problems. And for those of you that know history, you'll know that in essence, these arguments, which are very often promoted by leftist, so-called liberal, liberal uh, sort of um, kind of individuals, were precisely the arguments that in the interwar period were being argued by supporters of Mussolini. And many of you will have heard uh, the, the famous uh, expression that at least under Mussolini, the trains ran on time, as opposed to the chaotic conditions in a democratic society. But essentially, when you scratch the surface, and when you have this kind of claim that we need authority and governments or experts, and we need less democracy, all those claims really are part and parcel of a, an ethos of hostility to democracy, which is extremely powerful, so powerful, that it doesn't really need to announce itself. It's a, a secret hidden ideology that pervades all dimensions of our experience, which is why you can have this paradox where outwardly everybody pays lip service to democracy, but in reality, uh, democracy is not something that people feel enthusiastic about. It doesn't really inspire them in the way that it should, because what democracy is really all about is the rule of the people. It's the power of the people. And I just felt that it was very important to give a radical populist account of what democracy is, because I fear that unless um, people, the, the, the masses of our society are able to uh, and express their voice and want to express their voice, we're going to be in big trouble. Yeah, well, I was trying to explain to someone um, who I want to read the book uh, about what what your defense of democracy was about when i was talking about the issues that you raise in the book about the fact that there has been throughout history a fear of the masses and you call that democracy panic as a term that you use throughout the book um she said to me well i mean doesn't that just sound like you know elitism like from 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 time immemorial those that have wanted to rule society and have had the power to rule society have had the means to prevent the masses from having any say in the means through which society is organized she said well it's just she she kind of you know mentioned capitalism she said well this is just how it's always been what's different about arguing for you know democracy this is just elitism but in the book you you make a distinction about how there, there is actually something different going on. Would you mind going into that? Well, I, I think that um, there is some truth in what your friend says. And in fact, in the book, I, I, I quote Hannah Arendt, who actually talks about the miracle of freedom's rare appearance. And what Hannah Arendt means by this is that if you look back over the last, you know, 4,000 years or 2,500 two years, you'll find that there are very rare moments when there's a genuine culture of, of democracy in the sense that people are really living democracy where ordinary people really believe in themselves, in their capacity to, in some shape or form, influence uh, their faith. That's very, very rare. And if you look back historically, you, you know, you'll see there's that very special, very special moment uh, in Athens, but over two and a half uh, year, thousand years ago, years ago, when there is a, an incredible 
uh, upsurge of democratic impulse where the word democracy is coined, democratia meaning on the one hand, the demos, the people, and kratia power, so it's people's power. But what's interesting is that even before the word democracy is coined, the hostility, the oligarchical hostility to democracy is so powerful that for a very long time to come, democracy will be a dirty word and will be seen as a, as a very negative concept. And you got to then jump forward to the 17th century, where in the course of the English Civil War, people get turned on to this idea of freedom, that their consent uh, really matters, that, you know, that, people sh that governments should have no right to speak in their on their behalf, unless the people have given their consent. So a long time goes by. And, and I would argue that you know, the spirit of democracy, when you look at it, you know, are, are only kind of comes around on very special occasions, very few occasions, which is why uh, it is important for us in the 21st century not to take democracy for granted. I, I think that you know, regardless of whether you're for or against Brexit, there was this uh, incredible moment uh, that occurred around the referendum, where people, a lot of people who never get involved in politics, who aren't interested in making their voices heard, all of a sudden felt that for the first time in their lives, what they said actually mattered. And I think, uh, you know, certainly from my study and my research, going around and talking to people, I kept on meeting individuals who basically said, most of my life, it didn't really matter who I voted for. Most of my life, it didn't really matter uh, what, what my decision was because, you know, in my constituency, it's always the Tories that get elected or it's always Labour that get, gets elected. But now, for the first time, the outcome was far from clear, far from evident. And therefore, they felt that, you know, what they did was really quite important. And what I'm trying to do in the book is to suggest that that spirit of, of believing that your uh, contribution to public life can have very important consequences uh, is something that I want to you know sort of provide uh, a certain amount of intellectual support for uh, uh, so that that belief it doesn't just simply disappear the day after a referendum but continues to continues to inspire a significant section of society and then the difficult part of that of convincing people I mean especially around the Brexit referendum this was an argument I think a lot of people had is the question of expertise and you you point to it in the book where you talk about um, Socrates when he describes he's frustrated with this idea of the demos and he says you know when you're building a ship you don't just ask any Tom, Dick, or Harry, to borrow a modern phrase, uh, to build that ship. You hire architects, you have a captain. There are a serious amount of trained experts that go into the production of that ship. And in the same way, um, it's frustrating or sort of inconceivable to some people that you would have the serious business of running society. You know, and today, in terms of you know various parts of policy in relation to the economy, all the kind of complicated mechanisms that we run society by today to, you know people say it's inconceivable that I a uh, journalist would be able to know what to do with for example you know some form of monetary policy how do you get around that trepidation around mass engagement in politics well I think the the most important uh, thing is for people to understand that uh, wisdom about specific issues is always contextual that uh, there really isn't a science of politics or a science of public life that can give you a priori answer. So if you have a PhD in public administration, it doesn't really necessarily mean that you know better than the guy down the road, the butcher, or you know better than the mechanic, you know better than the cleaning lady, you know, sort of what that particular neighborhood, that particular community actually needs at that, that, that moment in time. And I think that the, the, the first person to really struggle with this in a satisfactory way was paradoxically uh, Machiavelli, who in his writings, Machiavelli makes the point you know, in, in, in his discourses that the wisdom of the masses uh, outweighs the wisdom of a prince or a small number of oligarchs. And what he's really getting at is that you and I and everybody who's involved in this chat room 
when we uh, sort of put together our collective experience, when we uh, uh, sort of synthesize our insights, are able to usually come up with uh, better and more pertinent decisions than somebody that's sitting in the SAGE committee. Now, the people in the SAGE committee are really good at number crunching, and I'm fairly sure that their epidemiological skills is far more sophisticated than mine. And I've got no uh, desire to question or challenge what they say about the numbers. But their expertise is about, you know, sort of providing us with uh, a number of options and a number of uh, kind of models about what is really taking place. And it's really up to us to make the political decision as to what, make, what use we make of that, whether we accept it, reject it, modify it, how we implement it. Because at the end of the day, you know, life is, is, is really much more than about uh, a, scient a scientific insight. Life is about human interaction. And uh, when it comes to the real experts in human interaction, it's the people that are part and parcel or integral to that interaction. I'm going to keep throwing sort of negative questions at you because I think it's most people's experience when they're talking about democracy. And you mentioned in the book that there's, if you go into any bookshop um, over the last few years, that it's, that they, you know, Waterstones, I've seen an actual set aside shelf that has, you know, books about the failure of democracy and why democracy has gone too far and um, all that kind of stuff. But but to, to throw another spanner in the works for you, I mean, it seems to me that part of the underlying criticism of democracy is this line that you often hear, oh, but, you know, people voted for Hitler, you can't trust people. Actually, I think that's a quote from a TV program, but it's the kind of thing that you get this sort of, there was that ridiculous incidence of it where um, they held out a poll to rename a boat and people named it a stupid name. And it, people held, you know, there were lots of commentators held it up as an example of the idiocy of crowds, the ridiculousness of the mob, the fact that you, you know, you really can't trust people. And it wasn't necessarily about the process of democracy. It was about the fact that human beings weren't to be trusted with this power. And putting aside the kind of the, the points that you've made already about the sort of the underlying elitism of much of that, because often people say, well, I can be trusted, but it's just her over there that can't be. Is there a deeper problem in relation to faith in humanity, which is something that you've touched upon in previous books that you've written, that also needs to be addressed in this, that you can trust the cleaner as much as you can trust the professor to make moral, and profound decisions, um, rather than having this underlying assumption that if you let loose on the masses, then inevitably things are going to head south. Well, I think that uh, you need to have the presumption that people are trustworthy. That uh, you have, you need to have the presumption that people have the um, capacity to exercise judgment and 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 behave in a responsible way. That's the that's the premise on which we enter public life. Uh, public life, which is a very precious domain of human experience, uh, ultimately uh, depends upon people who are prepared to trust. Now, just because you know, I'm prepared to trust, and I, that's the presumption with which I engage with you and anybody else, does not mean that uh, I blindly ignore uh, people whose behavior is irresponsible, or I simply echo the views of everybody else, because that's what's expected of me. I think the important thing about democracy and the demos and people interacting is that it creates a dynamic, a very important energetic dynamic that can have some very positive outcome. Now, as it happens, people are able to make some very bad decisions as well. I mean, you make mistakes, I make mistakes. We, this is part and parcel of the human experience. I happen to think that our individual mistakes are far more likely to be uh, neutralized and contained when there are other people around who are taking part in that uh, interaction than when it's simply three or four people sitting in the room. So I think on balance, you know, sort of uh, that dynamic has got that creative element. You know, people can make mistakes. As it happens, uh, Hitler was not elected by the German people. You know, Hitler uh, managed to gain power through a number of uh, elite 
uh, led manipulation where he, you know, precisely in the, in the election before he gained power, he actually lost a lot of votes. Nevertheless, by having a, by being able to enact a constitutional coup with the covert support of sections of the German oligarchy, he gained power rather than, you know, the majority of Germans never voted for Hitler uh, at any point. But that's just a myth that's kind of uh, brought out. Having said that, you know, it is possible that people, you know, in an election will vote what I think is the wrong way. And I've been disappointed on numerous occasions when in public life, uh, in, in meetings in my trade union or in uh, uh, various other kind of settings, people don't vote in the way that I, I think they should. And I think that's, that's tough. You know, that's, that's the way it, it is. Democracy doesn't promise that every single time discussion and debate will lead to the right kind of outcomes. What it does promise is the potential for the clarification of ideas. And, and, and that's got a very creative dimensions. And my argument that this is one reason why I wrote, I began writing this uh, little book is that, is that that process of living democracy is something that is good in and of itself. It's a, foundational value for a civilized society that will believe that the exercise of freedom and the capacity of people to voice their sentiments is something that's good in and of itself, even if, if its result is not what we would like. And therefore, what I argue is that rather than have a selective approach towards democracy, support it when the right people get elected, but criticize it when the wrong person gets elected, we have to live with the fact that on, uh, at various times, we will be on the losing side, that we will not be able to convince people of our opinion. And the solution to that is not to uh, write a common piece in the Times or another newspaper and criticize the lecturer for being stupid. The solution to that is to develop and elaborate our arguments to the point at which it could appeal to people, it could convince people. And not only that, but the solution to that is that you and I, have to learn from the experience of debate. And it may well be the case that those people who we, we believe were wrong actually have something important to teach us. There's you, as well as being a defense of democracy, this book is also a kind of a crash course in the history of um, dem democracy. And as you say, the history of anti-democratic thought as well. Um, but you, you point to the uh, birth of and the real uh, excitement around democracy in ancient Athens as a kind of a key point in human history that we have to get back to to really understand the value of uh, democracy. I mean, it, is it the case that we have to go back that far? Um, I'm thinking about that Hannah Arendt quote, that amazing Hannah Arendt quote, you know, uh, the miracle of freedom's rare appearance. Um, it's rather depressing that you have to go back that far. But what, what is it about what happened in Athens and the context of that time that is so important for understanding democracy in 2020? I think that there were many things that came together um, which were important for us to learn from. I think the people don't ask the question, why Athens? Right? They just assume it happened in Athens. But you know, why did it happen in Athens, not in Sparta, you know, not in Egypt, not in... Israel or any other of the other ancient civilizations or in India or China, why, why Athens? And I think there were a number of reasons for it, which, which are quite relevant for us in the 21st century. The first and most, for me, the most exciting thing about Athens was that it was the most argumentative culture that existed until that time and, and possibly even up to today. I mean, people were continually arguing in, in Athens. That was seen as a really positive uh, sort of contribution that, 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 that you were making. And that argumentative uh, sort of uh, ethos where people were expected to argue and not just simply conform and say yes, sir, and agree and echo other people's opinion was really important. The second uh, exciting thing about Athens for me is that Athens was a uniquely risk-taking culture. In Athens, the taking of risks, of exploration, of experimentation was in the DNA of that culture. Athenians went all over the world. Unlike other people who sat at home and expected things to happen, they went to Sicily, they went to different parts of the Mediterranean, they set up colonies, they were always looking for opportunities. 
And in the course of doing that, they, they actually learned a lot because they could see that people behave differently in different parts of the world. They could compare, they can contrast, they could abstract. And I think it's interesting that it was in Athens that reading for the first time acquired meaning. It, it's in Athens that we have the first genuine reading culture where people read. You know, people actually read, you know, not, not books like we have now, but, 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 but begin to read uh, sort of philosophical text. Why is that important? The reason why that's important is that it's only when you have things down on paper or, the, or papyrus or the equivalent of, or scrolls, when you have things down on paper that you can begin to see change and understand by, by, by writing things down that the way that things were in the past was different than now. It's only then that you can have a sense of history and it's only when you can have a sense of history that you can begin to think that you as an individual might be able to change history or at least influence history or at least play a modest part in the making of history. And that's really, that came together in Athens at a unique, very, very early stage. And that was a, those kind of cultural attributes were ones that were lost in many, many other parts of the world. And even in Rome and other kinds of cultures, where elements of that were integrated, the whole package of risk-taking, of argumentation, of reading and the reading culture, I mean, all those things didn't actually come together in the same kind of a way until the Renaissance in Italy uh, a long, long, long time later. Mm -hmm. That importance of reading links me to my next question, which is in chapter six of the book, you look at mass culture and really it pertains to this, the difficulty I have with squaring the issue of education in relation to democracy, because it seems like two issues happen at the same time. On the one hand, we're all very well acquainted now with the sort of panic around fake news and the idea of mass information and that people get fed too much stuff from Twitter feeds or elsewhere, um, and that they are so snowed under with all this rubbish that they really can't, there's too much mass culture and they can't make head nor tail of it. And at the same time, we're told that actually people aren't reading enough, that they aren't or they aren't reading the right stuff, that there is needs to be more education. And there's, you know, the a really popular idea at the moment uh, pushed by certain MPs and campaigners alike is the idea of citizens assemblies, which is where you get people into a room and sort of hothouse them. It happened in Ireland around the abortion referendum, feed them with the right kind of information from, you know, the experts and then it's only in that very managed means of education that they achieve the right kind of uh process of democracy um but that that's obviously contradictory uh, we're being told that we have too much information and actually too little information at the same time but you know it's a bit of a lazy answer that people often say well education is the key in these arguments without sounding sort of like a philistine what is the problem that you pick out in that chapter six of the sort of fetishization as education almost used as a block it seems a lot of the time forgetting actually on with the real argument of the value of democracy yeah i think if one really wants to uh, understand this question you could do worse than read hannah Arendt's uh, little essay called on education because the point that she makes is that when it comes to education, you know, there is no such thing as adult education, if you really understand what education means. Education actually means the transmission of knowledge and the legacy of the past from one generation to another. And education is something that adults do with children as they socialize them and as they bring them up and prepare them for adulthood and freedom. Whenever people talk about educating, adults or like today for example you know there's all this stuff in america uh, where uh, uh, this new kind of anti-racist argue go educate yourself you know what that really means is that you know i'm going to tell you what to think and what hannah Rand says is that when you, when somebody says that adults should be educated and you gave the example of deliberative democracy when people sit around and get educated so that they will become worthy citizens what you have is somebody behind the scenes trying to tell them what, the, what they should think. And I think that uh, whenever you have these uh, projects that bring people together to educate them in citizenship and everything else, 
they're not drawing on people's experience and, and, and not really harnessing the insights that they grew up with. They're basically telling them the values that they should be uh, sort of embracing. So in that sense, uh, uh, this kind of educating for democracy misses the point both about education and democracy, because education has got nothing to do with training adults to, you know, like the way you do monkeys to, you know, sort of jump up and down. You know, uh, with adults, you, you take them seriously as mature individuals and you have a discussion and you have an argument and you try to convince one another. You know, so that's, that's we call that argumentation and debate. And it's also, it completely uh, misses the point about democracy because democracy is not something that you get on a piece of paper or I'm gonna read a book and, and that will make me a Democrat. Democracy is something you acquire and, and, and a taste for democracy through living democracy, through voicing your views and being open to other people's views. So I think in that sense, these initiatives are merely the a medium through which sections of the cultural elites try to gain control over people's uh, uh, internal life and direct them in a way that, 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 they, that, that they kind of prefer. Mm -hmm. I've got just two more questions, Frank, and then we'll come out. So anyone who wants to raise their hand, um, do so, and I'll come to you when we come to the discussion. Um, the, I sort of want to ask the issue, the, the extent to which it's going to be difficult to uh, talk about democracy because uh, as a term, even actually as a word, it's, uh, it's become so bastardized in many ways. I mean, you use some of the examples in the book, including you know, the fact that we've got the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which you know, is a good example of the means through which that word has become mangled, but also uh, you know, more sort of subtle versions. I mean, the issue around Brexit was that suddenly people were having debates about the extent to which the European Union actually was a democratic process. I mean, there's ongoing rows in the UK about the voting system and whether that is um, really a, a, you know, a democratic process. But, but actually more fundamentally, one of the problems I find myself struggling with is, you know, democracy as a value in itself, as you've described, is uh, obviously very important. But what are, you mentioned citizenship a lot in the book and the importance of it. But is there a problem with there being a sort of lack of values that cohere a society today? You know, there, there is, it's very difficult to ask people to get engaged in democracy in, for example, the UK, when it seems a lot of the time we can't agree on what, what values we hold as a society, what values we aspire to, what value citizenship means. And so is there a kind of, I suppose what I'm asking is, are we living in a sort of pre-political moment almost where we have to decide what those values are in order to invigorate a true sense of the, the value of democracy? Well, I think that uh, we, have, we, have, we are confronted with the fact that, that many political co categories and concepts have been uh, denuded of meaning and they exist as zombie categories. And you know, if, if I was talking about the left and right, I would struggle to explain what the left and right means in the 21st century. I would have no problems to tell you what left and right meant in the 18th, 19th, and the 20th century. But today, you know, sort of what the left is and what the right is, uh, is, is really, uh, bears no relationship to the original meaning of the concept. And we have, we have this problem, particularly uh, in relation to the two fund foundational categories. One is freedom that I'm not going to talk about because freedom is just uh, has very, very much the same kind of problems with democracy. And the other is democracy because what's happened is that democracy has been uh, denuded of its uh, moral content and, and its value. And democracy is essentially seen as a kind of procedure for getting people elected. It's a second order principle, it's a, a medium through which elections take place. It's a medium for the gaining of consent of people. That's how it's, it's kind of generally seen. So it's a, it's a very much a technical orientation towards democracy and people, even well-meaning people, very often uh, allude to that very famous Winston Churchill quote when Churchill basically says that democracy, you know, sort of uh, is like the, the best of all the bad options. You know, but when you listen to what Churchill is saying, 
he's not particularly enthusiastic about democracy. He doesn't say it's a wonderful uh, medium uh, for uh, guiding public life. He says it's it's better than other forms of, uh, of of processes and procedures for getting the right kind of government. And I think he's wrong, because if you merely have a procedural understanding of democracy, if it, it becomes merely uh, an electoral process, then it's creative and it's transformative dimension, it's moral dimensions you know, will be lost altogether. And the purpose of the book is actually to acquaint people with the fact that uh, the, the capacity to voice your views is what's really important and to express your views and to engage with other people's views is what's important here, far more important than the casting of the ballot. What's important with the casting of the ballot is that that's been done on the basis of people's views having been expressed on the basis of people living democracy. But if people become detached and stop living a democratic life, as is the case very much today, then obviously under those circumstances, you will have this very elitist idea of democracy, where it becomes merely a question of what kind of procedure, you know, you know, we would like to see what kind of procedure we would like to take place. And I think that when that when that becomes the dominant view, then we need to challenge that. And I hope that, you know, in the, in a very small, modest way, my book is able to at least acquaint people with a different approach towards democracy. Something that I think. Uh, could inspire at least uh, at least captivate the imagination of those of us who take freedom seriously. My last question was going to be a topical one, um, Frank. When I was thinking about this launch, I thought that I would be asking about how we defend democracy in times of coronavirus, and we can get into that in the. I encourage people to ask questions about that, but I think I have to ask a question about what's going on in France, um, which you know how at a time when it feels like uh, a lot of the threats to democracy are um, not exactly authoritarian, they're kind of subtle, as you say in the book, um, they happen through a sort of disintegration of the value of democracy that happens with the sort of undermining through the, some of the things we've talked about. But the atrocities of the beheading in, and the knife attacks in Nice and the attacks in Avignon in Lyon at the French consulate in Saudi Arabia and indeed the beheading of Samuel Paty um, makes you think that there are some, you know, there are some very real and very violent threats to a way of life which, you know, in France anyway, the democracy is not perfect there, has holds dear at least to some extent, some of the values you've been talking about. So how do you defend democracy and why is it important to do so at a time when such barbarism is happening against a democratic way of life? Well, I think the real problem in France and in England for that matter, is that uh, a lot of people have, have been forced into a situation where they either switch off when they see uh, threats to a, a, a kind of a, a democratic ethos or a democratic way of life. Or worse still, I think what you often have is a kind of self-censorship where people know that something bad is going on, but either they don't bother to express a view or they're too scared or they feel that their views might be misinterpreted, you know, will not be seen in the right kind of a way. And I'm actually, what, what, you know, I'm glad you asked that question because what I'm really bothered about is not simply or, or principally what's going on in France. What I'm worried about is what's going on in England or Britain, where when you had the first beheading, you had a, a pretty cowardly, silent response on by sections of the media. I mean, when I was looking at certain newspapers, like the Guardian and in, in the Independent, the way they kind of talked about the beheading was like, this is not you know, it's a kind of inconvenient and, you know, sort of uh, not an issue for us. You know, it's not as sexy as, as for example, free school meals, you know, sort of something like that. So you had this kind of, you know, sort of uh, almost like a, a kind of self-conscious kind of silence or, 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 or an impulse not to really engage with what is a very real problem going on in France. Uh, complete absence of solidarity. And then I think, well, look, 
look what happened today, right? Today, this very day. Today we have a situation where you have a bunch of people demonstrating in front of the French embassy, you know, criticizing uh, the you know, people for daring to uh, sort of stand up for certain secular values and, you know, you know kind of basically uh, sort of uh, kind of uh, putting forward an Islamist standpoint and interpretation on the subject, which they're totally entitled to do in a democratic society. You know, it could be a radical Islamist and there's nothing wrong with you voicing your view about uh, how horrible a secular way of life is and how, what a, you know, how much of a threat is, that is to uh, a particular religion. But I, what I find really offensive is not what they were doing. What I find very offensive is that there wasn't a demonstration in front of the French embassy in full solidarity with the people that had been killed or beheaded and full solidarity with the kind of values that you know, are very important within French society, they weren't there, right? I mean, just stop and, and pause for a second. That says something to me about how seriously people take freedom and democracy. It's almost as if you know, a section of society puts up their feet, they stay at home, you know, kind of look at their watch, and they talk about free school meals you know, now and again, and that's like, the issue, issue of their time. But when it comes to what is a, a, a visceral th and an intellectual threat to democratic life, when precisely France needs solidarity, actually needs solidarity, because there are a lot of international pressures, you know, people uh, are either looking at their shoelaces and the media in particular in this, in this country uh, behaves in what is a totally cowardly, you know, sort of manner. And then they have the gall to publish an article, to maybe they'll do it tomorrow, talking about that democracy is not taken seriously in society. I mean, that's the paradox of this oligarchical media and their kind of uh, disenchantment with genuine democratic way of life. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Frank. I better stop there because I could keep going and we've got a huge amount of hands uh, Ray. So what I'll do is I'll take about four or five and come back to you periodically, Frank. So uh, Richard Taylor, we have you first. Well, firstly, thank you, Frank, for your time. I'd love to spend like 20 minutes in a room by myself with you because your brain is just amazing, especially for a Welshman. I understood everything you said. <laughs> um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you for publishing this book. I can't wait to get my hands on it. Democracy Under Siege. Don't let them lock it down. I think it's an amazing title and I'm going to pre-order my copy as soon as I get off this Zoom call tonight. That's it over. Right. Second thing is this, the final thing, just quickly. Um, you talked about democracy and how uh, Brexit allowed a lot of people to engage with democracy and get involved with politics. And people like myself, if I can be honest here, I'm an ex-drug addict. Um, I went to rehabilitation, changed my life, married, got into politics because of the Brexit, the referendum vote and joined the Brexit party, et cetera, et cetera. My point is this, that a lot of people from my background, from the streets, people who don't really engage with politics whatsoever. They see politics as an autocracy, not a democracy. They see it as, you know, there's just one person in charge. He's the prime minister. He tells you what to do. You listen to what he says, and that's it. And it wasn't until the Brexit campaign, actually, that it really opened my eyes and made me understand that I have a voice, that regardless of my past or where I've come from, the journey that I've been on, it doesn't actually define who I am as a person. And my voice does matter. And I think what Brexit did and has allowed a lot of people to do is to get involved in politics and realize their voice does make a difference. And so I think, you know, for a lot of people from my background that I've just shared with you all on your openly, it's hard for us to understand how democracy works because we see it as an autocracy. Uh, until your eyes are opened and you engage with politics, as I've done in recent, more recent years, and I've learned a lot and uh, it's really been very helpful obviously academy ideas and many other aspects uh, of politics that I've been involved in. But what, what, what's the, what, 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 how do we get people from my background to engage? Because there's millions of us out there who don't feel politics matters to our everyday lives. We just think it's, it's they're distant. They're, you know, Westminster has nothing to do with us little people. And I think that's a challenge that really I want to ask you, how do we engage those people? 
Brilliant. No, thank you, Richard. That's really important. The question of apathy as well, is, which is, you know, a plague that's been on British politics for a very long time. Uh, John Holbrook. Frank, I wanted to ask you about this um, issue of the left and the right, because you said you don't know what the terms mean anymore, which I find a bit surprising because isn't it quite clear what being left wing means today? I mean, you know, it means reading The Guardian. It means hating Brexit. It means not trusting the people. It means loving the Black Lives Matter movement. It embraces identity politics. In essence, it means celebrating difference and the individual. That is today's left wing notion. Now, I know it's very different from how it was in the 80s when you could talk about the left wing being associated with a class interest. That's gone. And what the left is now left with doing is celebrating this grotesque love of identity politics and difference, which is the best way you can have of undermining democracy, because the left have this ideology which they love to shove down our throats, um, which is the antithesis of democracy. Now, what, what, the other side of the coin is the right wing. Now, I know that traditionally the right you would never have associated with democracy, but if you go back to say someone like Edmund Burke, it's not too difficult, is it, to tease out the basis for democracy there because his notion of knowledge was very much based on tradition and the acquired wisdom of generations. That also connects with democracy and his view of society was one which had to be harmonious and had to be reached by consent and accord between all of its members. So there is there a kernel, a, a, a long-standing philosophical tradition that that just needs to be injected with a bit of democracy. Um, and that, it seems to me, is, is, is the way to go forward. And I, I just have a sense, Frank, that you, you're, you're not wanting to come to terms with the extent to which the world has changed, which is why you, you're, you're not prepared to be as critical of the left as you need to be, and you're not prepared to embrace the right as I think you ought to be. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, I've got Maddy next, so I'm asking to unmute. So if you can unmute yourself. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I've got great sympathy with much of what, what you've said. But you've actually introduced a number of um, issues which are worrisome. And um, I'm not going in, into the definition of democracy and Churchill's uh, Code with respect to uh, democracy is the worst form of government, except all others, I mean, all those aside. But in the way that uh, you introduce a couple of notions and issues, which was, I call the worrisome. What you actually said with respect to SAGE, that there are number crunches, you are really relegating the expertise, especially in the time that we do, as Ella alluded to, that we need expertise, the COVID-19 situation and the uh, expertise coming from people like Neil Ferguson, Chris Whitty, and uh, across the across the pond by Anthony Fauci, and trying to actually equate that with what you say, the term I'm using, that uh, the cleaning lady or a plumber, and just say that they both camps have actually got virtually the same say. I think I find that, if I understood you correctly, I really find that worrisome, okay? okay. Because we actually look what has been happening uh, in America, okay? The, the Trump supporters, because they are because they won the vote within the within the confine of their system that they are they are the right things where we should respect their vote, but it doesn't make that right. And I think you actually said that. Just 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 to finish off, perhaps very quickly, Anna, very quickly, Ella is that um, the, the attack you actually made on Guardian and the Independent is really not warranted for me because I'm a avid Guardian reader and I do not agree 
with what to say that the, 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 the stance they took with respect to the, uh, the, the French atrocities. In the way they actually have uh, uh, reported the news, yes, they should report the news and not an opinion. But if you read the opinion column, which I had, they have actually have deplored mm -hmm. strongly what is actually been happening in France. Okay. It's a very Thank strident you. challenge. Thank you. That's exactly what we like. Thank you, Mandy. Right. I've got Joe Hurley now. What, Frank, have you found has been the uh, most challenging thing about the shift from a vibrant discussion around uh, Brexit, political, straightforward discussion about the involvement of the public in a discussion, to what that says about democracy, moving to a discussion about public health around COVID, where the population has effectively been demobilized. I'm interested to try to understand the relationship between how we act as citizens in public debates to how the public is being asked to respond to something which um, appears to be something dictated by expertise and how we navigate that where the reality for most people is then opinion isn't being asked for they've been demobilized on mass yet you can't navigate a public health crisis through committee and i think that poses a really difficult question where going back to one of your first points in terms of your explanation around having vibrant public life um, is based around debate and discussion. I think we're all in a very difficult position to know how to navigate this um, discussion. So I think what COVID poses in quite an interesting way is the relationship between uh, not a classical political discussion where we're left to debate stuff within the context of our families and day-to-day -day life versus a political discussion which seems to be happening outside of our control and I think that poses new questions for how we um, assert ourselves in terms of public life and I'm just wondering how you've navigated some of those discussions and where you've had successes. Okay, great. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to take Rick and then I'm going to come back to you, Frank, and then we're going to keep coming out. So everyone who's got their hand up, don't worry, we'll definitely come to you. So uh, Rick, fire away. Um, Frank, this is Rick Schrader. I'm also a fan of Hannah Arendt. I've been troubled, as I suspect you have, watching liberal left friends go soft on all sorts of liberties, at least in the United States. That means the liberties in the First Amendment people who no longer want people having free exercise of religion and gathering together, get upset if they attend funerals, are opposed to freedom of association that would lead to people gathering together. A lot of people on the liberal left have given those up as liberties, and it's a surprise. But it seems to me that, and I, I like your, your pointing to the moral core, um, the feature of expressive liberty being featured that way. But it seems to me that most of your discussion seems to equate liberal democracy with the concept of democracy. And I wonder if that isn't an error. Certainly the demos, when it uses its expressive liberties to express its view, are not necessarily going to adopt liberal principles. There are all sorts of non-liberal democracies around and homogeneous societies do that all the time. They're not necessarily going to have liberal attitudes towards religious diversity, towards minority groups. So much of your discussion, it seems to me, is about freedom, not about the demos per se. And um, I'd be very interested to see what you say about all those people on the liberal left who out of fear of their own health are prepared to subordinate these liberties to their health concerns um, and want there to be some third party that's going to keep other people from doing all sorts of things that would be expressions of their liberty. Lynn, thank you very much, um, Rick. So Frank, just come back on a few things there, just two or three minutes on anything you want to focus on. 
Well, the last uh, question is the most difficult one to answer because uh, I take both liberties and, and the demos seriously. And it seems to me that uh, Rick is right, that the demos might not necessarily uh, come up with liberal solutions uh, and might not want to uh, support certain forms of um, uh, liberal related ideals. Uh, but for me, that's an argument for, for, uh, for engaging in, in debate and discussion with the demos to uh, get people to understand the importance of liberty for themselves. The liberty is not a gift that you provide for other people, but it's something that you need for yourself in order for you to be a, an active citizen. And in my own project, I'm trying to marry the two, liberty and, and, and the demos. I think that the COVID questions are really quite interesting. And, and, and in case there's any misunderstanding, I, I got no problem with SAGE at all. I think SAGE should be doing the epidemiological scientific work. Uh, what I'm arguing for is a distinction between health, public health on the one hand and politics on the other hand. And my concern is that the moment we're tending to medicalize politics and we're tending to politicize health, the two things are occurring side by side. And the way that I look at it, when I use the example of cleaning ladies and plumbers, having the same voice as a member of SAGE, I wasn't talking about their scientific work. That's their domain. What I was talking about is, is their views on what should happen within the context of a particular community. In other words, you know, people in my neighborhood ought to be the ones that decide you know, how many people, it should be five or six people that can hang out with each other at home. I think that those are decisions that are political decisions. There is no scientific rule that basically says that unless, you know, sort of, uh, you know, we have less than six people, we're going we're gonna to have a problem. These are decisions that we make. And we know, for example, that where I live in Kent, where the uh, infection rates are really, really low, there's no point in having the same kind of uh, regime as in other, in, in other parts where infections are very, very high. But I think in any case, you know, sort of uh, democratic decision-making mustn't go to sleep just because there's a public health problem. Because the one thing that we, knew from the, we know from the study of disasters and catastrophes is that the solidarity of communities provides the best antidote for dealing with it, you know, rather than anything else. I just wanna say a little thing about left and right. I think John is just wrong. Uh, for example, when he says that the left today is really about the individual, I think that, I mean, I'm about the individual. I, I, for me, the individual is really quite important. And individual autonomy is something I take very seriously. Identity politics is conspicuous by its hatred for individual difference. It, it likes, you know, identity difference. It fossilizes identities, but it, it looks down upon people who say, I'm an individual who are making my, I decide for myself certain decisions. So the left is not really for the individual. And at the moment, there is the point I, I would make is that the reason why I said that left and right have become zombie categories is because I don't find anything in, anything in the contemporary right that actually resembles any of the traditional uh, conservative values uh, of the, early 19th century that John was describing. I think conservatism has become a very technocratic, opportunistic, you know, sort of outlook that uh, often serves as the mirror image of what's called the left. The, the two seems to have become, you know, they've, they've lost a lot of their uh, impulses. And, and I think to that extent, what we got to do is not simply say, oh, I know where the left is and the right is. We got to remind ourselves that what we have now are political entities that are very, very different uh, than was the case in the past. Um, at the, I'll come back to uh, Richard at the end about how to, how to deal with, you know, sort of the question on the streets. I don't want to take up too much time. Okay, thanks, Frank. Um, yeah, someone in the chat has written that it's noted that everyone wants to make speeches as opposed to asking questions. That there's um, no problem with making comments and mini speeches. Uh, often the best questions are wrapped up, hidden in a someone's contribution so no qualms there but I think if people made it a little snappier we might get through some more people so with that in mind let's go to Sam Parker. Hi Frank uh, great talk as always um, I guess what I want to ask 
is to what extent the dwindling faith in democracy is due to changes in information dissemination and how that might have sort of exposed existing fault lines. And I guess by what I mean by that is that sort of in the pre-internet age, what you might sort of deem the elites had a monopoly over narratives because information was disseminated through what you might call the usual channels, whether they be, you know, the print press or TV media. And with the internet, it's just completely shaken the foundations of how we receive information. And I think an example is that is, you know, what's going on currently with the US election, how um, particularly with the Hunter Biden um, sort of stories in the relation to Chinese corruption by social media platforms to prevent these stories from coming out. And I think the way that might have affected things, sorry, I can see myself, is that um, the elites have become sort of more overt in their corruption and the way in which they censor people because they feel threatened that they can't control the narrative anymore. And I guess what you might call sort of the masses now realize that the information they were receiving in the past might not have been wholly true. And fundamentally from both sides that has fractured the belief in democracy. I don't know, I'm just asking what your thoughts on that might be. Brilliant, thanks very much, Sam. Right, Richard Ings. Thanks, uh, Ella, um, and thanks, Frank. Uh, book sounds really interesting. I just I wanted to agree uh, with your a um, uh, little bit with your last point, which was to do with um, uh, championing individual the individual and uh, and the fact that that seems to be something that the left has, has somewhat abandoned. But I wanted to think of uh, to ask you about it in in respect to um, the way, in particular, with COVID. But but I've noticed this in in other societies as well that. That actually, there's an emphasis um, on the collective and the sort of solidarity which you were talking about as being a greater value than individualism, which is very much associated with selfishness. So, so in fact, in, in that respect, uh, for I think for many people, even if they confuse perhaps um, the me mechanics of democracy with a culture of democracy, is that it feels like we're in a really democratic society, perhaps because because you know the government are making decisions which we all kind of bought into we're we're doing it for each other we're helping each other out and all i hear from the about the you know, various marches that i've been on against the lockdown is how selfish i am and, and and what an idiot i am for for actually making it harder for people to to live their lives so i'm, I'm wondering what you think about that, that this kind of idea of actually we live in the most sort of you know collective um, uh, looking out for each other type of society, which feels in that sense kind of very democratic and, and perhaps what you would suggest uh, a, a real democracy should be. Great, thank you very much, Richard. So we now have Carlton Brick from Scotland. Carlton. Thank you very much, uh, all the way from Scotland. Uh, Frank, uh, 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 in your essay in Spiked uh, today, you talk about that one of the first expressions of this anti-democratic or the kind of anti-democratic ethos is formed through the environmental movement in Germany and it adopts a, a kind of Marxist facade. Um, I wonder if you could just expand a little bit on what makes Marxism so uh, applicable to that anti-democratic kind of narrative because I've always seen myself as being a Marxist uh, however kind of maybe that's not the case anymore in the sense of, so I just wondered if you could just expand on what is it about Marxism, particularly in the seventies that lends itself to that, that anti-democratic uh, narrative. Great, thanks Carlton. Just before I come to Kerry, someone, Nicola Thomas has just mentioned in the chat that she wants a reading list to look a bit more in depth about the, you know, the impact on modern democracy of different moments in history. And I'd just like to direct you to the work of the BOI charity um, which is separate to the Academy of Ideas, but if you it's go on, so one of my colleagues will put a link in the chat, which has for a number of years now run a project called the Academy, which has lectures are available online that are have Frank himself and others talking about the um, history of this. And there's a huge amount of great reading and listening to do this. So if you want to find out more about that, just go to the BOI charity and look up the Academy. Um, right now, Kerry Dingle. Thanks very much, Ella. And Frank, that's really inspiring. My copy of the book arrived at tea time. I haven't opened it yet, but I'm very excited. And I think it's um, given what people have said and all the excuses that you've um, had to deal with, it's a very important moment to have something like this. 
Um, just on a couple of quick things. Uh, one of the other excuses, I don't know if you touch on it in the book that I come across with young people that we're trying to discuss this with is um, that democracy itself is a system that is easily corruptible. And so young people I know from Eastern Europe will tell you that democracy lends itself to, you know, fraud and bribes and all the rest of it. I don't know if that's something, um, obviously it's again, seeing democracy as a process rather than as a, as a meaningful uh, mechanism for us controlling our lives. And secondly, obviously we've seen that in relation to Trump and uh, I get a barrage of emails every day now telling me that, you know, the, the Trump is running this evil campaign that is anti-democratic and none of the postal votes are going to get counted, blah, blah, blah. And I wondered what your thoughts are on that. And similarly, another excuse is the one of scale. The democracy is, is workable. Again, it's seen as a technical process when it's small scale but you can't have democracy on in this huge more globalized world um really working so i wondered if you got any thoughts on the scale excuse too just quickly i wanted to say that i on i think it was medi's point that you know sage is not an expert on the life of the cleaning lady sage does not know what it means to for her life or his life when the offices where they work are closed and even for those furloughed, what it's like to live on, you know, two thirds of a very low income. And we are the experts on our lives. And I think part, maybe this relates to Richard Ings's point too, you know, the degradation of democracy often means, especially with the young people I talk to, that there is unfortunately no tradition now of putting forward your own situation, arguing even from the point of your experience, or winning people to your side and to an argument. It's always, let's look to a third party. And I think that's been intensified and exacerbated during COVID and lockdown. Thank you very much, Carrie. On corruption, democracy in the uh, US elections, it's be interesting to see how far the kind of Russia won it argument's gonna go this year, particularly because as I heard on the radio this morning, uh, a tiger and a bear in Siberia that can tell the future both picked the watermelon carb of joe biden's head so i don't know if that will be deemed as interference or not but we shall see alka far away thank you thank you thank you frank um i i, I think it just the, you frank you said you're very much for the individual and, and i think that's really important because i think the, the kind of collective versus individual thing as richard Ing, ings put it i mean it, it just seems to me it's it's a bit of a non a non-event really, because what kind of solidarity can you have if your view of the individual is as somebody that's quite fearful or weak or, or very, very vulnerable? And I'm not talking about COVID in particular, but just that generally there is a real kind of um, problem with the way we understand or kind of can, can accept the individual today, because it's either slagged off from as a right wing marketeer um, phenomena or, or, or it's in a very therapeutic sense. And, and it, um, it reminds me, if I, can I just say a very quick anecdote, Ella? Yes. It's a little bit I've been reading about um, a debate, a discussion between Sartre and Georges Bataille about Baudelaire. Just bear with me, it will become clear. So um, uh, Sartre is saying, look, Baudelaire should have left his poetry. He should have left all this, you know, fannying about with the dark side and all the in-depth poetic stuff. He should come out into the world of social man and look for the signs forward and look for which way we're going to take progress and take humanity forward in a, in a more sociological and political sense. And George Bataille said, and I think this is just brilliant, he said, yes, but you're forgetting before you need, you know, you, for that to happen, you need a man that's looking for something. You need, you need the, the individual subject who is able, who thinks it's worthwhile to look for answers and debate and engage. And it does seem to me that we have um, a bit of a problem with that. But what I, the question I wanted to ask you, Frank, was about the um, zombie political categories and what effect you think this is having in terms of authority being percolated into other spheres, other public or cultural or civic bodies. Because today I was asked by um, a teacher who said, in relation to Kemi Badenoch's recent speech on schools not teaching CRT, critical race theory, as facts, 
And um, this person who's in education said to me, that's going to have such a chilling effect. No teacher will be able to ever teach white privilege again. You know, as if teachers have been teaching a term that only came into public discourse a, a few months ago, like forever. And, and they seem entirely oblivious to the fact that there are so many teachers who are already finding it so um, difficult to speak out, not because of what a politician has said, but just because they fear kind of more, a more dispersed social censorship or censure or stigma, stigmatization. Great, thanks very much, Alka. Um, Frank, I'm gonna come to you now because we're running out of time and then I'll come back out for a last largish round of um, questions. So anything you want to pick up on <clears throat> that last few comments and questions from the floor? Well, solidarity and individual go hand in hand. And I think the mistake that people make is they think uh, instead of uh, understanding what an individual is, they confuse an individual with individualism, which is uh, uh, kind of when you make an ide ideology out of it, which individualism you know, is, is, is not something that I think should be celebrated, but the individual is because the individual is the foundation for the uh, sort of for, for, the, for the human subject to to become uh, able to express their selves and through that to give meaning to human autonomy and I think that it, it is very very interesting that neither if you want to use two zombie categories neither the the right nor the left today in the 21st century takes uh, individual autonomy seriously and they kind of denounce it and they criticize it and I could give you a lot more examples of foundational categories that were very important to the, to the Enlightenment and to the humanist worldview are both rejected by both sides, even when they don't know it. And that's why I think what's interesting is that, you know, sort of a lot of the debates today are zombie debates where people react against one another. So, you know, when right wing people are denied the right to express themselves, as unfortunately they are in university and elsewhere, they become free speech warriors all of a sudden. Uh, and they kind of, you know, so they, they become you know, our allies or my allies, because I, you know, anybody that's for free speech, you know, I'm very, very, uh, you know, I kind of support them. And, uh, but, and similarly, the left, you know, sort of when they kind of are put into a corner, they suddenly change their position. And, you know, that relates to the thing about the, the Greens, that all of a sudden, the, the Marxists of the 70s became environmentalists because they couldn't talk about class politics anymore, but suddenly environmentalism became their kind of mate that they kind of talked about. Uh, just on Carlton's point, I don't think that Marxism uh, is necessarily anti-democratic. I mean, Marx himself, uh, you know, sort of um, in his writings, you know, wasn't anti-democratic. I think that Marxism can be used like anything can be used at the, in, in the present moment for anti-democratic tyrannical ends. And I think unfortunately there is within Marxism and Marxist politics an underestimation of the significance of democracy. I think that's been the case for a very, very long time that the importance of, uh, of taking democracy seriously is absolutely crucial. The, the one point that I haven't made, which is the most powerful point against identity politics, is that democracy is based on a very simple principle, which is that every single citizen is politically equal to another person, regardless of their background. Every single citizen is a political, is, is each other's political equal. And one of the things that we know is that the only equality that really means anything is not the ones that are, are talked about today, inclusion and diversity and everything else. The only equality that matters is political equality. Because that's the equality that allows all of us uh, to be able to make an impact together on what our world will be like in the future. Great. Thanks, Frank. Right. This is your last chance um, to get the questions in and comments into Frank. So please raise your hand. And if you can't do it, just notify me in the chat. Uh, we're going to start off with Chantal. Brilliant. Right. Um, very simple question. How do you think we can set about re-educating young people from an early age in order to understand democracy. And I say this as somebody who did study politics and philosophy at university, but I was fortunate enough to study for a short period in France and at the age of 
um, in the summer because my mother was ill. And we just, I remember writing democracy, government of the people, by the people, for the people, and discussing this at the age of 10. And so I've been listening to this wonderful discussion, but I'm, I could go through many of the terms and think, well, I can define um, green in two different ways. They're not necessarily Marxist. I would say that I'm, I was a member of the Liberal Party and I'm a member of the Green Party now. So yes, there has been a trend that maybe Marxists of the 70s have now adopted Green Party politics in Germany, but that's not the same necessarily here. So I think we need to start defining terms. Can we do that in the classroom? Can we have debates um, from that? How would you go about it? Because I don't think we're gonna get anywhere until we do try and get to terms with what these definitions are, because it's very clear, one person's democracy, democracy, freedom to or freedom from, I could go on and on, but there are different definitions out there. Brilliant. Thank you, Chantelle. Right. Mo Lovett. Um, hi. Uh, thanks for that, Frank and Ella. Really interesting interview. And um, one of the things I noticed in the Brexit interregnum in, uh, interregnum in those kind of four years when Remainers and Brexiteers were kind of uh, battling for, for that um, kind of implementation of that vote was that two uh, definitions of democracy were flying about. And the way I sort of thought about it at the time is that it was very much a kind of a remain a concern about the institutions of liberal democracy being undermined um, uh, by the Brexit vote. And you, you kind of hear that as well in, in, in terms of Trump and the kind of anti-populist rhetoric that you get in the US, that the, the, the kind of um, instruments of democracy, the kind of, um, what I would say, the technocratic kind of institutions and um, infrastructure of democracy are being threatened by um, populism, whereas um, I've always understood democracy to be kind of, a, you know, an end in and of itself and a kind of a, a, a living, breathing thing that we continue to do. And that's why these discussions are so important. But um, it just does strike me that there are two definitions of, um, of democracy flying around. And I wonder how you best articulate um, what we mean by democracy. OK, great. Thanks very much, um, Mo. Mehdi has asked me several times to allow him to very quickly come back on something you said, Frank. So, Mehdi, thank you so much. A minute. Go ahead. OK, thank you. Thank you, Ella. Uh, I'll be very quick because this is my second time round, and I don't want to monopolize. Frank, you are really wrong on, on the expertise. You're actually uh, talking about technical and scientific expertise. If you think the, num the, the, the number six, which was um, um, advocated with regard to the mixing, or the distance of two meters apart, they were just plucked out of the, out of the tree, and there is no scientific basis for that. There are risk calculations behind every uh, decisions or every recommendation that sages make. It's not something that you, Carrie and I, can sit down and decide whether it can be six people uh, can actually be within that bubble or it can be four and a half people. There are risk assessments associated with that and I just couldn't okay. let you get away with, with that uh, without coming back. Thank you. Great. Thank you. No, we no, we won't let me get away with anything. So thanks, Mehdi. Right now, I'm going to come to Monica. Hi. Um, someone mentioned just now um, the importance of the definition of democracy, and I think that that's essential because if you go back to people power and Aristotle, I think he would be horrified um, by what we think of as democracy, because in ancient Greece it was just like a private members club for gentlemen who are rich. And if you look at the founding fathers in America, the situation was not that dissimilar. So the people were not trusted really. Um, so I think we need to look at what we mean by uh, democracy. And maybe it is unworkable because it was never intended that everybody should have a vote. Um, as I understand it in Aristotle's day. Um, and certainly it was a kind of a gentleman's club Great, thanks. And actually that links with something that several people have mentioned in the chat in relation to the internet and sort of this idea that if you've got this mass participation, you know, often via the internet in politics, that kind of unwieldy, the unwieldy nature of that, how does that fit into 
democratic process. Okay, Nancy McDermott. Um, I wanted to ask Frank if you could say a little bit more about talking to um, uh, like teens and young people about this because um, right now um, they're so flattered and there is so much discussion of, uh, of uh, allowing 16 year olds to vote that I find myself in this position which seems really anti-democratic of saying no you cannot vote and this is you know this is not a, a good democratic thing um, and uh, it just you know I'm just finding it hard to get my head around. Great, thanks very much, Nancy. Uh, Kevin Yule. Um, yeah, it strikes me that the problem with democracy is, or the enemy of democracy is technocracy, at least at the moment. And it seems to work through raising issues that um, are not possible to solve democratically. So for instance, racial issues, it's there's always a minority there. Or health issues, there's a sort of imperative that seems to come above democracy. And I just wonder whether you think that that's, that's the biggest problem is technocracy at the moment, Frank, and uh, what we can do about it. Great, thanks very much, Kevin. I'm gonna to come to Jan Bowman next. Um, yeah, it was just quickly, um, uh, well, two things. One is whoever it was that said that democracy seems to just be, a, what was just a rich man's club in, in ancient Athens. I have to strongly disagree having, to listen, having listened to the Yale lectures on ancient Greek democracy, and, and I think that um, I think that if you that the, the, the fact that um, it was the most democratic society then ever that, that had ever been um, before then, and the the, the slavery situation was um, much more like having an odd job man than um, having slaves as in the deep south, the way we normally understand it. Um, and just one, just the, yeah. I think it's, you're misunderstanding democracy in, in ancient Greece. But just um, finally, I, I, I don't think you need a university degree to have a moral compass. And I think that, um, that, that there's a misunderstanding as well about um, what the question of expertise is and SAGE. SAGE just epidemiologists are good on health. They, they have no more of a better moral compass because they've got university degrees or degrees in epidemiology than a plumber does. And I think we tend to have, or society these days does tend to have an idea that unless you've got a university ID degree, you don't have ethics. And I think morals and politics are much, very much the same thing. And any adult um, has a moral compass. 16 year olds do not have the kind of moral compass that I would trust to be able to vote. Um, that's what being an adult gives you. You learn how, how you learn about ethics. And I think that's key mm -hmm. to democracy and who should vote and what a citizen is. Thanks for that, Frank. Um, if I might refer back to uh, a left winger before they became zombies, um, I remember reading Trotsky, Leon Trotsky's point of view on the emergence of democracy, British democracy in particular, as it emerged through Locke and Mill and all of that. And um, he said that um, the idea that the day labourer who uh, you know slept in the same clothes for a month had equality with Rothschild, the banker, was um, was, a, was an abstraction that acted as a kind of smoke and mirrors, hiding the reality of their uh, existence, which was gross inequality. And um, he, he seemed to indicate that, uh, you know, the practice of democracy um, could only hide, you know, the, the inequalities, the real inequalities in human existence that existed then and obviously still exist now. So I'm kind of trying to work out in my head how, you know, your argument for democracy as a value in and of itself can take us beyond, um, you know, you say that it's, you know, it, 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 it leads directly to political debate and argumentation and so forth. But I'm still finding it difficult to get away from it as an abstraction and how it begins to deal with the real inequalities that exist between in human society. Okay, thanks very much, Dennis. And finally, I've got Claire Fox. Uh, for reasons that are entirely undemocratic, I've had to listen to endless hours of debates in the House of Lords about the Internal Market Bill, in which I've heard some of the best speeches I've ever heard from some of the finest legal brains arguing about how if you challenge the rule of law, as it's argued the government are doing, you're undermining democracy. And it strikes me all the time when I'm listening to this that their arguments are actually 
uh, slapping the face of popular democracy when they're doing it because they're actually trying to uh, thwart uh, Brexit happening. But just what is the balance, do you think, um, Frank, between the rule of law and democracy? Does democracy need something else in order for it to mean anything? Um, and uh, in another discussion that we had on the book recently, um, uh, I think it was actually Ella herself used the example of Poland, where there appears to be a, a democratic decision to, uh, you know, ban abortion, which I disagree with. How do, how do you, and, and uh, that, that might be legally right, is it democratically right? How do you deal with those kind of issues? And then just just very quickly that somebody asked, is there a really good reading list? And Ella gave a great answer. But um, one of the things I loved about your book, which is kind of like a pamphlet in a way, Frank, is that it, it, it itself is a reading list because each and every chapter kind of gives you something that I wrote down that I wanted to read. So it's a very popular, populist an accessible way uh, to understanding uh, democracy. And I hope everybody here reads it and buys it for all their friends as well. Great, thank you, Claire. Definitely echo that, it's a must read. Um, and something like, it's only, how much is it, Frank? It's 1750 or something like that. So a bargain for anyone who's thinking of stocking up on Christmas presents now that lockdown's coming. So Frank, your final thoughts on anything that's been raised and any issues you want to, and thoughts you want to leave us with. Well, I can't really answer all the questions. There'd just be too much, but i just like to uh, bring a few of them together. <clears throat> I think the um, point that Dennis raised about Trotsky um, overlooks one very important point, which is that political equality is not an abstraction. It's not something that exists up in the sky. Political equality means that everybody is equal under the law. Everybody uh, under the law has the same rights and everybody has got the same power to influence political outcomes. Now, political equality by itself does not get rid of social and economic and biological inequalities of various sorts. But I would argue that if you're interested in real equality, then the instrument through which real equality is achieved is in the first instance through political equality. Without political equality, none of the other equalities matter. You know, if you haven't got a voice, which is what political equality gives you, then other forms of equality uh, have a, a limited kind of paper-like kind of character. So the point is, is that political equality is logically prior, precedes the acquisition of other forms of equality. And the minute political equality becomes compromised, then other forms of equality also fall by the wayside at the same time. People have asked a lot of questions about definition of de democracy. And I would uh, suggest that we make up our own definition in the sense that you know, we are you know, free people. We don't have to go by the definitions that are given to us on different bits of paper. We need to develop a definition that brings together the uh, demos side, the side of the people, and the and the uh, and the power side, you know, where power lies. You've got to somehow ensure that there's a very clear relationship between people's aspiration and the exercise of power. And I think to that extent, you know, we could be fairly open-minded. I don't mind if 16-year-olds have the right to vote, as long as they fought for that right. At the moment, the demand for 16-year-olds to have the right to vote are made by adults who want to flatter them. It's made by adults who want to manipulate the electoral system. But if you had a genuine movement of young people who were so hungry for participation, I would look upon that favorably. And that relates to uh, uh, somebody earlier I was saying, how do, I think it was Chantal, how we re-educate uh, or educate young people. I think. We have to somehow instill the life of freedom and the life of democracy in them at a very early point. I think we have to educate them for freedom. That's the key to it. At the moment, we educate young people to be fat, passive individuals who are very much uh, aware of their powerlessness and, and nothing more. Uh, I think it was Sam that asked the question about the internet. I'm, I'm a big fan of the internet for a very simple reason that it, you know, despite the lot of fake news you have and the censorship that's being imposed 
by uh, various kind of platforms, the internet gives us far more opportunities to uh, raise our voice than was the case in the past. I think people with limited resources can make quite a big impact if they get their act together on the internet. Look, for example, what Spike has managed to achieve with next to no funding over the years, how you, you know, literally millions of people now read what they say. And, and that could not have happened if we were simply confined to the print media. So I think the internet uh, can be a positive uh, resource, but obviously uh, as, as, the case, as was the case offline, so to in online, this, the impulse towards censorship is really, really powerful. I think I'm a bit of an expert when it comes to risk assessment. I've written quite a lot of books on it, and I'm not an epidemiologist, but a sociologist. I can assure maybe that the kind of risk assessment that is done uh, uh, in relation to how you implement policy is a very subjective accomplishment. It's not, it's got very little to do with hard science. It's got very little to do with the kind of the, the real scientific work that, that, that is being done to fight the virus. When it comes to the way that risk assessment is framed in relation to policies, it's really political decisions that prevail because risk assessment in terms of weighing up the risk of, of, of letting five people to six people gather together is made on a political calculation about who you trust, how much you trust people, what the impact of this will be, how it will be seen. And these are entirely political matters, which uh, about which I think I've got as much of an expertise as, as they do in SAGE. But I also think that ordinary people living in families also have a, a lot of very important things to say uh, in, in relation to that. So I think that is seems to me to be uh, sort of quite important. Um, yeah, uh, finally, on the point that kind of Rick made uh, about how you talk to people and how do you get people involved in this? Difficult question, but uh, the way that I see it is that it's through our personal example. If, if people see you being interested in public life, if people see that, see that you, you have something exciting to say about the events of the day, if you can get people to understand that uh, they don't need to be waiting for somebody else to make decisions for them. But in fact, they can be part of that decision-making by their behavior. And those are the kind of attributes that we need to popularize and get across. Obviously it's easier to do that with young people who have less responsibility and they don't have the burden of looking after a family. But I think that all members of society have got that, this kind of potential and it only takes a relatively small number of people to do this for, uh, for people to begin to get the message. Um, Claire's question about the rule of law is very complex. All I would say is that uh, the rule of law uh, is essential for democracy, uh, for the running of the, and the maintenance of democracy, but the rule of law is ultimately um, based upon democratic decision-making because the laws that are made, the, the laws that rule over our democratic life, where do they come from? They shouldn't come from the heads of a number, a small number of judges. The law should come from uh, the decisions and, and the discussions that people have made uh, in debate over a protracted period of time. So in that sense, I see democracy as being logically prior, but absolutely interconnected with the rule of law. Right, thank you very much, Frank. If any, everyone can join me in giving you a round of applause. Thank you, Ella. Thank you, Ella, as well. Now, uh, I've got just a few announcements. The first most important one being that if you are uh, looking for a place to buy Frank's book, and I'm sure all of you who have been listening tonight will want to get your copy, um, I'm just going to post a link in the chat now, which is a link to Frank's book, which I lied is not 17 quid, it's 10.99 on Amazon. Uh, so you can get two copies. But the uh, just an important note that is if you are buying it via Amazon, if you could take the trouble to click through um, and to use Amazon Smile, which is a process where you can support a charity in your purchase, you can click and support the BOI charity um, by buying Frank. So there's two birds, one stone. And I'm sure it'd be very helpful to Frank if when you have read the book that you leave a review on Amazon. Um, so those three things, make sure you get it, get the book, get it via Amazon Smile. 
and tell Amazon what you think of Frank's book once you've read it. I read it really genuinely in less than 24 hours. Um, it was that good. So I'm sure you should all buy a book. And then uh, coming up um, in terms of events, I have to flag something that Frank is involved in, uh, again, in relation to the BOI charity, which is that usually some people have noted that there usually have would have been a lot of events on. In fact, actually, it's a sore spot among the Academy of Ideas team tonight um, because we were talking this morning about the fact that we would usually have been in battle mode organizing the Battle of Ideas Festival up to our necks in lanyards and courting speakers and doing all sorts but obviously that's not happening this year. What is happening is the BOI Charities uh, annual event, the Academy, which can't happen in the flesh is happening online on the 28th of November and Frank is uh, giving a one of the last keynote um, lectures on that. The uh, this this one in the 28th of November is on race and identity politics, um, something which has been touched on a number of times tonight. So here is the link for that. It's a free event, um, a whole day event of different lectures and book clubs and discussions. So please make sure you sign up to that if you want to hear Frank talk more in depth about identity politics. Um, but for now and tonight. That's me, that's Frank. Um, thanks very much for coming. And if you have any spare change in your pockets or in your bank accounts, give it to the academyofideas.org.uk forward slash donate. Thanks very much, everyone, and good night. <laughs>